All right, welcome to the Film School for Teens podcast. I am your host, Chris, and I'm so excited to be sitting down for another episode. And today is going to be a great episode. Why? Because we've got an amazing guest. So I have been listening to this band uh, for so long, and now we have the one of the band members who's also a film composer. So we're sitting down today with Chris Dudley from Under Oath and film composer. So welcome, Chris Dudley, uh, one of the members of the greatest I don't even know what you guys would classify Under oh, Oath as anymore. The greatest band of all time. That's okay. okay. Sorry. That's Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> totally joking. I'm I didn't realize joking. I was talking to uh, Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> Got it. Okay. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Chris Dudley, he is a an amazing musician with one of my favorite bands of all time, as well as you now are scoring movies. Yeah. Weird, huh? Well, that's crazy. So I, so I think it's crazy, too. Like, I... <laughs> yeah it's 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 wild i uh you know i have always just like been such a film nerd and film nut like from the time i was in middle school and i you know i i always wanted to do something in film and you know considering my career ended up being music that kind of was something that uh, you know, I was like, all right, well, that's probably going to be my in there. And then, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a story, but it just ended up working out. So I'm, I'm just thankful. Like it's, it's crazy. I love it. That's awesome. So for our, our students that are not familiar with Chris Dudley, the name you are part of under oath and your performance in that group is what, what is your primary role inside of under oath? I say uh, I do electronics, so you know, keyboards, synthesizers, uh, you know, virtual instruments, whatever. All the electronic stuff is uh, is me. Um, just walk me through, man. How did you get involved with scoring films from being in a screamo, you know, kind of metalcore band? How did you make that transition, and and what did you do in that regards? Man, so uh, you know, like I said, I just I I've been saying I had been saying for years that I just wanted to do film scores. Like I I was like I want to score film, and but it was one of those things where it was like that would be cool to do someday. You know, that would be that would be fun. I would love to do that, but it was there were never really like at that point any concrete steps taken to do it. It was just like man, that would be cool, you know. And uh, I was actually. This was, I think, early 2017. Um, I was uh, watching a movie with my wife. I don't even remember what movie it was, but I had said again to her for like the 500 at the time, like, man, I would the, the score to this rules. I would love to do something like that someday. And she was like, well, why don't you just do it? And I was like, well, a number of reasons. One, I've never done it, so I don't know how. Two, I don't have any connections in that world. Like, I don't know how that works. Three, it's I'm sure it's really hard. And four, I just don't even know how to get started. And she was like, well, why don't you just say that you're doing it and say that it's what you do and then see what happens, you know, see, you know, I don't know if you want to call it manifesting or whatever, but like, just like, see if anything comes about. If you just say, hey, I am a film composer and, uh, so what I did, you know, thankfully, I, I, you know, I've been in this band for a really long time. And, you know, I had uh, had a bit of a, uh, you know, social media uh, presence. So I just posted online, hey, I'm opening my studio up to writing projects. So if anybody has a, a game, a film, an album, like anything that you want music written for, contact me. But it was all just with the... It, I, I just wanted to be able to work in film, but I didn't feel comfortable just being like, Hey, I'm now writing film scores because I wasn't, you know? So I did that. And from that point on, it's the, it's the story that you hear all the time. But when you're trying to get into the industry or any industry, you hate hearing because it's like, Oh, I did this one tiny thing for no money. And then the guy who was working on that, he was working on this other thing and he, talked to that producer and was like, Hey, like, why don't you talk to this guy? And, 
you know, and then the producer for that was on working on another project. So it's like, it was just a years long snowball of me just meeting people and, you know, doing the best work that I could and trying not to screw it up and, you know, people taking notice, you know, and, you know, my big thing though, that I always tell people when they ask like, okay, you know, well, that's cool that you were able to, when they say, you know, it's cool that you were able to do that, but you already had this like springboard of the band and social media to be able to, to do that. Even if it's just an initial spark, um, you know, I don't have that, you know? And, you know, I think, you know, probably most of the people who are watching this would say the same thing. But I, what I say to that is that so many of the people that I work with, almost all of them didn't have that. It was literally the, uh, they just did the work. They were as vocal about it as possible. They made quality stuff in whatever field they're in. And eventually somebody took notice. And um, I think that is such a, it, it, it's not technically like a concrete thing to tell people like, hey, like, you know, okay, just, just do the work. But it's like, especially now the fact that social media is such a prevalent thing, you can, you know, have an Instagram up in 10 minutes that is just, uh, if, if you're a composer or if you're an actor or whatever, where it's like, hey, this is now going to be where I highlight the things that I do. And you know, follow people who do what you do, uh, that you enjoy, uh, you know, just, you know, learn, uh, continue to make garbage because that's a huge thing. Uh, you know, just recognizing that when you get started, it's not going to be good. And just working through that and taking that as part of the process. Like, I think that's just such a, such a huge thing. Oh, dude, that's, that's perfect. And I think that that sentiment of understand that you're going to make garbage is so crucial because there's so many, I think students of ours that have this image in their head of when they go to make their, their film for our classes or their pictures, their YouTube channel, that it's going to look a certain way. It's going to feel a certain way. And then they get there with the final product and it's not how they imagined it. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it, it could be great. It could be mediocre, whatever the case, it's just in their head. They had this high expectation and, and for them, it just, they didn't meet it. Yeah. And uh, I think I probably heard it put best by Ed Sheeran. Uh, he had stated, uh, he, I, I saw this interview with him and he said that uh, you have to look at when you're starting out in any able, sort of creative say, you know, field, cool. you, you have to look at it as like uh, walking into a house that hasn't been lived in uh, to, in a long time. Do that. It's like, and if you want to get water out of the faucet, spark, if you just um, hold you know, your cup under the, that, the you know? faucet and, and turn the water you know, think, on, you know, you're going to get brown, gross water because it hasn't been, those pipes haven't been used in God knows how long, if ever. But all you have to do in order to get all that garbage out is just keep the faucet on, keep the, keep the water uh, flowing and creatively keep the ideas flowing the work. and they i think it's so vocal about it key possible. to re to just they to expect eat, no matter how hard you try expect stuff however many of the first things you do whether it's films songs auditions and, um, whatever it is that you're doing just that expect that the first a, however many are not going to be good that way if you do nail like it like early then that's like, just like oh hey, crap like, like you know okay just just do the work. an added bonus but, it's but like, if you are especially now doing stuff that that's not up to that standard thing. that you've set for yourself it's not discouraging because you're like okay like i knew this was going to happen i have you know for me i mean looking at somebody like ed sheeran who's one of the most successful musicians period like looking at him saying that or looking at you know any number of directors that i've read interviews with that say the same thing they're like yeah like when i was in school i did a bunch of shorts that were not good but i learned how to do it while doing that so if you look at that as just okay i'm on the path that these heavyweights are on like and i just have to keep at it you know keep doing the work i think that's that's key i think even even you personally can take the first couple albums of under oath and look at how different they are and how much, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying the first two albums or anything are bad. Not, mm -hmm. not at all, but oh, I know what you're saying though, for sure. Collectively from the road, from 
you know, even from their only chasing safety, which, which probably I would say, you know, and maybe you agree is the album that really put you guys out there. Mm -hmm. And even up until disambiguation, right. Which I have a special place for that album in my heart, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's so different. And each time each album you guys did got more strong as you guys, as a group and, and just the, the, the coherence between you guys was just i i could tell at least from my ears seemed like each time was just getting better and better and so uh, i'm sure the same with the films that you've scored so i'm curious you know just do the work with that sentiment how much grooves or riffs do you have laid down that will probably never see the light of day but you've got them ready in case a film comes along or something that just that feels right for it hard drives worth like <laughs> hundreds of gigs of stuff that's just sitting like i've got my closet in my studio that's just full of stuff that i'll be honest there's so much there that even if i was working on something that there was a perfect idea for sitting in that closet on a drive i don't even know what's there mm. like because i because i just do so much any whether it's big things or little things like i'll just put down ideas and every now and then something will click you know and um yeah so there's a lot and one thing that really changed my entire approach to you know what you said about just doing the work was an interview that i read with woody allen quite a few years ago and he you know because he's a he's very prolific like he's all like multiple movies a year sometimes like he's just always has something coming out and they asked him they're like well how do you do that like how do you just how do you have this much material that comes out and he said that what he does is he sets a certain amount of hours per day and he was like whether i'm feeling like it or not i sit down and i write and if at the end of the night 80% of what I wrote is garbage. The 20% that I wrote that's good would not have come had I just waited to, to feel like writing or waited to feel inspired. And I started implementing that for myself as well. Like I stopped waiting to be inspired. I stopped waiting to feel it. I was just like, I'm going to do the work, whether I want to write or not, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do it. And, and I think in particular, when you get, to a level if you're able to get to a level in working in any sort of film or any sort of creative endeavor in general where that's your career you have to do that like you're not gonna if you're an actor you're not gonna want to feel like going to set every day um you're not gonna feel like you know if you're a director there's times when you're just like i I just wish somebody else would make these decisions if you are a composer I'll tell you that I would say probably 60% of the time when I walk into my studio, it's not a let's go. I'm ready. It's a, okay, let's, let's see if we can get this done, you know? And you know, those other times are great. Like when, when it's like, I'm feeling inspired and stuff's just happening. Like that's great. But, uh, recognizing that just doing the work is the biggest part of it. it that's huge. And, and what do you say for, for our students that have, you know, a lot more time than we do, you know, right. With careers, families, you know, that kind of stuff. It's easier for them to put in that work possibly. And it's just like working out, right. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get fit if you work out once a week. Yep. But if the more you're putting in that work, the more you're composing, working on your music, the better you're going to become for when that job does come and you can score a film, Mm -hmm. you're going to be even more fine tuned than you would have six months ago if you only did it every time you got a gig, which may not be every day or, or, or whatever. So when it comes to scoring, what's your approach when you first sit down? Are you given the script, you know, for, for our audience that may not know how the process works, what happens for you as a composer? So, uh, it is really dependent on the project. Um, I've worked on films where I'm talking to the director in the middle of the script phase where he's like, hey, I've got three quarters of this script written. I'm going to send it to you. Let's see what you think. And we kind of work from there where, you know, we start feeling out sounds, feeling out instruments like 
uh, for instance, the first uh, the first full length that I full length feature that I uh, scored was called Whelm, and it's a it's like a period drama. It takes place in the tw- in the twenties, um, and that was what happened with that one. I was sent a uh, a script that was I'd say it was about ninety percent done, and the director was just like, hey, you know send me some ideas like send me let's talk let's talk instrumentation let's talk vibe um and you know we knew that it took place in the 20s so i was like all right it's got to be mostly stringed instruments headed instruments wood instruments like uh wind instruments not electronic not anything modern sounding because it has to has to fit the time uh so i was thankful on that being my first feature that i had that time that much time to work on it because i was you know still honestly trying to figure out how I was going to do it. Um, but I've worked on other films uh, where like the last film that I just got done with, uh, it's called peace in the Valley. Um, I was given a, a, a final edit, like right at, right out, out of the gate, um, oh. which was, uh, I didn't think I was going to enjoy it as much as I did, but it was nice having like a solid, like, okay, like here's what I'm working with. Uh, so that was that was really good. Uh, so it it runs the gamut between those two things, you know. Like that, there's a a horror film that I did called Bad Candy, and that one, uh, I was talking to the director during the script phase and you know initial photography, uh, and you know he was sending me screenshots and that sort of stuff from stuff that, as they were editing, and that was cool. But you know, it's not the same time, it or it's not the same process for any two projects. It's uh, you know, just really a lot of it depends on how the director likes to work. Um, you know, some directors are very hands on and they are very fingers in the dirt of the music. And other directors are literally just, you know, I'll send a 15 minute segment of music to a director and he'll be like, OK, cool. Yeah, that works. And, and it just it just depends. So, uh, yeah, it, I, I wish I had a more concrete answer, but it's literally just uh, depends. So we have um, a project that we just finished, um, a film called Split Second, a short film. And there's moments where, you know, our composer comes back and says, can you give me two more seconds on that specific scene at this time marker or whatever edit, you know, to, to fit whatever he's trying to work in musically. How often do you do that specifically where you're asking for an editorial change to fit your melody or... Uh, the music or does that has that not happened with you i don't do that um yeah no because the i view my place as uh, there there are times where we'll have discussions about a scene i will send a cue like a, a, a an idea and there there may have been like one or two times where the director will suggest like hey you know what what if what if we just like move this here or move this there but uh as a composer, I would not go to a an editor or a director and say like, "Hey, you have to change the edit to match the music." Like, the way that I view the composer is like, you have the film, and then you have to work with that. Like, whatever you have to do, whether you have to, you know, have to input tempo a tempo ramp somewhere to be able to hit a cue, you know. And and honestly, that's such a huge part of the learning curve of being a composer in general is just figuring out how to how to uh, work around those problems. Uh, you know, if, if it's like, man, like this isn't hitting the way that I want, like, uh, and yeah, I mean, if you're in a position where you can do that, where you can just go to the director and be like, Hey, like, can we just move this? Like, that's great. I, I just don't do that. Cause I don't feel that's really my place as a composer to, to have my hands in the, in the edit. It's more so, Hey, I need to like, I need to do my my job and get it to where it needs to go. And if, you know, if the director or the editor at some point uh, decide that that would work for them to change something, then great. Then, you know, <laughs> uh, we're all the better for it. <laughs> well, and, and, and just to defense of our composer, if in case he listens, he, he never said, I need you to change this. It was more a, hey, I think this would work really well melodically if yeah. we held on for just another second or whatever it is just for the beats and the transitions. And that's great too. Like the, the situation that you guys are in, because it's like, we're all like working on this thing together. It's not like, 
you're you are a, an editor hired for this project or a composer hired for this feature film it's like it's like more like working together with friends so you could just be like yo like if we just move this thing that would be sick it's there there's not not those walls of like what's couth for me to say and what's not sure. so yeah, yeah I, I i found that quite a few times where i'm working on something and i'm just like i just do the music like i'm i'm not gonna say anything other than you know what i'm working on so um how often do you get to work with you know, what, what actual roles do you work with besides just the director? Are you in contact with the producers? Are you ever working with anybody other than director and producers in your role? Uh, no, uh, I, I don't think I have as of yet. It's, uh, let me think, uh, I was working on, uh, it was a few months back. Uh, there's this movie called, uh, Orphan First Kill, which is a uh, it's a it's a prequel to a horror movie called Orphan. Um, and on that one, I was working with because I was I was basically coming in in the last like six weeks to like help them get over the finish line. Like I was so I was working with the head composer and then I was also working with the music editor, uh, which that was my first time working with the music editor, which I thought was was great. Um, so, yeah, other than that one experience of working with that music editor, it's been either a producer or uh, a director. Um, but what's funny is uh, the film I was talking about, Peace in the Valley, that I just got done with the producer i was working with uh, was also the lead actress of the film so that was an interesting uh dichotomy which i haven't really experienced before you know so i'm going back and forth with her you know about you know all the she was heading up all the music talk so that was a you know a unique situation i think that's cool so let me ask you uh technically what kind of equipment are you using I, I, well, I'm, maybe a better question would be, what equipment would you suggest to some of our students who, you know, have a much smaller budget, mm -hmm. you know, maybe just have a PC or a MacBook Air? Mm -hmm. What would you suggest them getting started if this was a path down they 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 wanted to go in, in the industry? So uh, if you have a Mac of any sort, I would recommend uh, GarageBand right off the bat. It comes with a Mac it's free uh and the great thing like because the daw that uh, that like the program that i use to do all my work is called uh logic and uh garage band is basically logic light um if you get to know garage band and how garage band works once you get the money to buy logic which is uh i think logic is 199 dollars which in the grand is it 300 okay yeah. Yeah. um so once you're ready to take that step into logic, you'll already have all of your workflow down. I mean, it's there's a lot more to it when you get into logic, but you already have the basics. So that would be the biggest one. Uh, if you are on PC, um, I would say maybe Adobe Audition. Would you say that would be good enough to get them started? Maybe or uh, I don't. I don't know about Cubase. I think Cubase might have a free version. Uh, uh, remember, um, or Fruity Loops might have uh, a free version. Uh, yeah, I would honestly have to look into that. I uh, I'm not sure about PC because I don't I don't work on PC, and uh, most of the people that I uh, that I work with in particular don't don't work on PC, but a ton of a level uh composers uh in hollywood work on pc so that's not a that's not a thing at all um you know what's good now though is as far as uh it's called a daw it's a digital audio workstation it's basically the program in which you do everything there's a number of them there's you know pro tools there's uh oh if you're on PC Pro Tools has a thing where you can pay monthly. I think it's like nine dollars a month, and you have you have a full on Pro Tools. What? Rig. Yeah. So uh, That's yeah, if you're insane. PC, yeah, check out check that out. Um, but what's good is you can use any DAW you want, and you know I would say five, ten, maybe even five years ago that wasn't the case. There were some DAWs that just were not as good as others, but we're in a place now technologically where there 
all great. Logic is great. Pro Tools, Cubase, uh, 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 yeah, what what any any DAW that you can think of is basically you can use it in a level if you want to. So it's about you know just getting to know the one that you that you want. Um, other than that, uh, there's a uh, there's a company called IK Multimedia that makes a lot of low cost audio interfaces to you know basically an audio interface is something that you can plug into your computer and then you can plug an instrument into that whether it's a guitar a microphone or whatever you can get a very low cost one from them or you can go on like uh craigslist or facebook marketplace or whatever and you can get those things really cheap so get a get a very cheap audio interface uh and a very cheap uh, MIDI controller, mm. which again I would recommend going on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace and just buying one off of there if you're able to, uh, because uh, if you have the computer already, you know with with another fifty dollars you can be up and running, and uh, it's it's a very low barrier to entry now, which is just wow amazing. Um, and also I'll say that. When I first got started, a big thing for me was I don't know how to work to picture. Like, I don't know how to write to picture. Like, if I have a scene, like, how do you go about doing it? And and my first thought was I just need to practice. Like, I need to find scenes that don't have any uh, uh, score to them and let me just practice trying to do that. Um, and I scoured the internet for weeks just compile like i found different quarters of the internet that had these different scenes like scenes from big some huge movie like avenger type movies that had all the score that were, that were not the score was not there mm. movies i had never heard of different types of scenes and i compiled them all into a dropbox and if anybody hits me up on my social media um and asks for it i just send them the dropbox link because i think that's an invaluable tool to be able to just have a video file and be able to right to it i think that's mm. a, that's a huge help so um just throwing that out there if anybody wants that i'm easy to find online and i'll i'll send it to you would you be willing to share that with us and we could just include it in this episode 100 um awesome. when, when, we, when we get off of here uh, i'll email you that uh, sure that yep that's that's fantastic because i i know for me when i was getting started with you know podcasting and everything you know i thought i needed the best of everything yeah. You know, I got three SM7Bs, which are super expensive. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I went for the the best PreSonus audio box I could find and, you know, the the best XLRs. But and, now... and, it's, and it's most it's more about knowing how to use the tools that you have versus having all the best tools. Like what's that? Uh, there's a very recent. uh I think it's a Steven Soderbergh movie that he did with all on the iPhone. Unsane. Yes. I yeah. don't think that's appropriate for your audience, if I'm not mistaken. It is not. <laughs> yes. But this film, I mean, I don't know if you have talked about it at all, but it was shot completely on an iPhone. Granted, you know, they edited it in other things, but you could, I'm, I'm sure you talk about this all the time, how if you just have an iPhone, you can do just amazing stuff. So yeah, it's, it's just about knowing how to use the tools that you have. And, um, you know, I think what's really cool too is Billy Eilish has really opened a lot of kids eyes to that as well. Um, Oh, also another little thing about logic is if you're able to get the money together to get logic, you can download, uh, sessions like these sessions from some Billie Eilish songs where, oh, wow. because it was all done, it was all done in logic with stock plugins you can that you they they sent those sessions to Apple and Apple gives them to people who buy Logic, so you can actually see all the all the effects, the vocal chain, how they compressed everything. Like it's all there, and wow. it's a great study tool. So just throwing that out there. That is super cool. Now one one last question here, uh, since we're nearing the end of our time, is there any chance that somebody could get started who doesn't have a computer but has maybe an iPad or just an iPhone? that can utilize GarageBand on those platforms? Yes. So um, as far as how GarageBand would work, uh, I mean, because you wouldn't be able to, to, to have any 
picture that you'd be able to write to, but you could use the instruments within GarageBand uh, to make an amazing amount of stuff. Um, I so would they could use these to just do the work, essentially, yeah. right? They could practice and hone in on the craft? Yes, and there's also a ton of very, very good uh, instruments that you can buy in the uh, app store for your phone. Like, uh, There's this company called Moog that is probably the top synthesizer company in the world. They have a free synth that you can get for the iPhone that sounds incredible. And I used it on Under Oath's last record. I just used because oh, wow. I... I had written this thing on my phone on a plane, which I do all the time. I'm always like there. There's three songs off our last record that had stuff from my phone on it. And that I don't think any of the apps that I was using cost more than like five bucks. Um, but there's a whole world of, you know, samplers that you can get on the phone where you can like record something with your phone speaker and then, you know, mess with it on the phone and stuff. So, yeah, there's stuff you can do a ton. And there's also... Uh, there are MIDI controllers that you can get that are Bluetooth capable. So you can set your phone up and actually be playing like a full keyboard, but using your phone as the as the interface. So that's definitely wow. a thing. I I don't I'm I'm drawing a blank on specifically what controllers there are, but all you have to do is Google uh iOS GarageBand MIDI controller, and there will be a number of them that pop up. And then again, always what I would recommend is finding out what those pieces of equipment are and then going and trying to buy them used because mo- none of this stuff you have to pay full price for. Like it's it, the quality that you, it, it's there's no point. Just buy yeah. something used. Yeah, I'm, I'm all about that. So the barrier of entry for people understanding how this, this works is very low. They can do a lot with an iPhone or an iPad. They don't have to have a computer or even a great computer in order to do this, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And, then, and another idea too, um, for anybody that saw our video on how to make a movie trailer, we, and I'll share this with you too, in case, you know, you share it with anybody else. There's a website called lalal, L-A-L-A-L dot, um, dot AI, I think. And what they do is they specialize in separating vocals from music. And so mm-hmm. what you can actually do is you can export a scene from a movie, or if you have a clip from YouTube, toss it up there, 10 minutes are free, and then it will separate the dialogue from the mm-hmm. score. And so then you've got a scoreless scene, essentially, mm-hmm. and you can practice writing your own. Yeah. You know, if there's a specific, you know, scene that a student you have in mind that you want to practice with that is not inside of uh, Chris's Dropbox that he's going to be so kind enough to share with you guys. That's a, that's an easy and free method to, to get that done as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many just free and extremely cheap tools. Like if, if there was this amount of stuff when I was in high school, (laughs) oh my gosh, like that, I, 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 the stuff that I had to go through to get my first keyboard when I was in high school and the amount of money that I had to pay for something that had less functionality than a free app on a phone uh, just makes me angry if I think about it. But uh, I, I'll just I'll just continue to not think about it. Yeah, the first editing software I ever got was the letter U, U Lead Video Studio. And it was $150 and it's awful. Yeah. Like, <laughs> And now you get iMovie for free, which is Final Cut Lite. Yes. You know, just like GarageBand versus Logic. So yep. I, I get you. Chris Dudley, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I think you've shared some incredibly valuable information, great insight into your specific uh, place in the industry. Seriously, man, this was in- incredible. All right. Yeah, man. No worries. We'll talk soon, hopefully. Thank you so much to Chris Dudley for coming on FS4T, the podcast. And thank you guys for listening. This has been a great episode that has just really opened a lot of uh, opportunities for a lot of people that want to do composing, whether it's for your own film or that's just what you want to do in the industry. As he shared, the barrier of entry is so low with the tools and resources out there. Not like when we got started in our journey, myself, Damon, Chris Dudley, and all the other people that we've been interviewing. You guys have so many great resources at your disposal. Take advantage of them, right? Go watch some great movies. Go make some great movies. And we'll see you next week.